This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast, a podcast with a worldwide listenership that explores the broad world of preservation from every angle, from drones to mudlarking and everything in between. Now, let's get preserving. The future of cities is an issue that gains a lot of press since the pandemic has left its indelible mark on these places. Today's guest, Mac McComas, is someone who's immersed in the data that could help to make cities more sustainable, livable, and prosperous. Topics of great interest to many PreserveCast listeners. This is Nick Redding, and you're listening to PreserveCast. Today, we're excited to be joined by Mac McComas, who is the Senior Program Manager at the Johns Hopkins University's 21st Century Cities Initiative. And we're going to be learning what that means and talking with him about the fascinating work that they're doing there and, and the really clear overlap that their work has with the work of the broader preservation community. But before we jump into that, we normally like to get to know our guests. So, Mac... Um, Where'd you grow up? What's your background, your education? And then maybe we'll jump into how you ended up with this initiative. But who are you? Who are we talking to? Yeah, so thanks. Uh, thanks for having me on the podcast, Nick. So uh, I grew up in a suburb uh, right outside Boston. Uh, and I have very fond memories of, of walking past uh, some of the beautiful brownstones located in the city's Beacon Hill and Back Bay neighborhoods. And uh, uh, going to America's oldest bottle park, Fenway Park, as a kid, but but don't uh, Marylanders don't don't hold me that against me. I uh, quickly became an Orioles fan after after moving to Baltimore, uh, partly because I, I love underdogs. Um, but I left Boston after high school um, and I went to school in Scotland, uh, where I got my Master of Arts degree at the University of Edinburgh and my Master of Letters degree at the University of St Andrews, and uh, both were in Scottish history. Uh, where my dissertations focused on emigration to the U.S. in the 19th century and always had a, a long interest in kind of um, uh, economics, cities, migration, um, and, and kind of how people respond to uh, an ever-changing world. And so you do that research, you get your degree, and presumably you come back to the States and where's your first job in the field? Yeah. So, so I, I came to Baltimore, uh, around nine years ago. Uh, and my first couple jobs, uh, was at a, a social change consulting company. Uh, and then I did, um, some work at a neighborhood based, uh, community service organization doing kind of data analytics. And what I quickly realized is that, um, I loved working in cities. I loved, uh, everything about cities, but I was more interested in, in the research side of things. And, and what I saw was that there were so many programs and policies that were being implemented that were not guided by research and, and not evidence-based. And, and that kind of frustrated me. So, so that's um, really why I decided to um, uh, join John Hop, Johns Hopkins and, and take up this opportunity at the 21st Century Cities Initiative. And I, and I should say, just so everyone's listening, this is like our little um, advertisement for it. It's Johns Hopkins, just like everyone, right? Like, you, and you have it behind. People aren't seeing the video here, but he's got a very snazzy um, Zoom background that says Johns Hopkins. And it's like nails on a chalkboard when anyone ever says John, John Hopkins, right? Like you're like, uh, and it's Johns, not because uh, John owned Hopkins, but that was his name. Uh, and there's a whole story about Johns Hopkins and we could dive into that. Um, and, and some of that story remains to be known and remains to be written and is the subject of controversy, but, um, thought I'd throw that out there. Um, people it's a, it's, it's gotta be one of the most mispronounced, uh, names in academia. Yeah. And, and funnily enough, when you, when you start, uh, working at Johns Hopkins, they make you watch a, uh, you know, just an introductory short HR video. And one of the first things they say is it's Johns Hopkins, not John. So, you know, they, they try to try to force <laughs> it upon you uh, yeah. as soon as you uh, join the university, which I just thought was hilarious. Yeah, well, we're doing we're doing our part. And that was not a paid advertisement by by Johns Hopkins. So let's talk about the 21st Century Initiative. And I guess, you know, to be fair, even backing up sort of in all seriousness, for someone who's not familiar, maybe listening overseas, um, give us a sense for the scale of Johns Hopkins, and then let's dive into the initiative and what it's what it's working on, where its funding comes from, that kind of deal. Yeah, so so for folks that are not as familiar with Johns Hopkins, it is the largest employer in the state of Maryland. Um, 
which you know is is uh, not common for for U.S. states to have a university as the largest employer. It is also consistently ranked as the uh, number one research university in the U.S. as measured by uh, research funding, so so dollars coming in to do uh, research. So it is primarily a research university. Um, and that, you know, goes from everything from uh, the great work being done at um, Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health to um, the Applied Physics Laboratory um, to work on, you know, sociology, economics, engineering, um, biostatistics. There's just so much activity uh, going on at, at Johns Hopkins. And that's, you know, kind of, it's, it's a unique place to be. Uh, and that's kind of why uh, we're lucky to have that because our initiative, uh, the 21st Century Cities Initiative, really seeks to um, build up and, and catalyze the uh, research that's already being done on cities uh, at Hopkins, as well as to conduct uh, new research on cities. And where did it come about? How did it all come together? Was there some uh, mega donor who, who just dropped the bundle of cash? How did, how did this all come together? Why did Hopkins put the emphasis and focus on this? Yeah, so so it was an initiative that uh, came out of um, Johns Hopkins President uh, Ron Daniels' office, and um, he was creating a, a series of signature initiatives. Uh, most of them were were um, kind of health or, or engineering, kind of hard science focused. But he wanted uh, one of these signature initiatives to focus on cities and, and social sciences, and really focus in on on Baltimore um, and how the university could be a, a good partner uh, with the city. And bring in, um, you know, lessons from from other cities and best practices. So it's a little bit of town gown kind of going on there, um, but with a desire to kind of look broader, it, it, obviously even beyond um, Baltimore. So speaking of which, um, about a year or so ago, uh, you co-authored the book "Unlocking the Potential of Post-Industrial Cities" um, with Matthew Kahn, um, and give listeners a sense for what you were trying to tackle on that. And then we'll talk about a year on how you feel given how much seems to change every day. Um, a year is like a, it's like a, <laughs> like a decade uh, used to be or something. I don't know. But um, what, what, what was it that you were trying to tackle and, and what, what kind of ground did you cover in that book? Sure. So, so my co-author Matthew Kahn is a, uh, so at the time of Bloomberg Distinguished uh, Professor of Economics and Business at Hopkins, he's now the Provost Professor of Economics at, at USC. Um, but back when we started to write the book, it was uh, prior to the pandemic. Um, and we were really trying to look at um, Baltimore and we look at five other post-industrial cities. So we look at Baltimore, Cleveland, Detroit, Philadelphia, Pittsburgh, and St. Louis. Um, and, and we wanted to use uh, recent research in the field of urban economics to look at why these cities were struggling at a time when other cities were prospering. Uh, we wanted to look at kind of opportunities that these cities had going forward and how the field of urban economics could help these cities make progress uh, towards improving outcomes. And again, we started the book before the pandemic. So we, we went in kind of with that frame of mind. And then, you know, the pandemic happened, the kind of world of research shifted. Um, but, but I think, you know, what we, the issue we were addressing is when um, uh, a shock happens to a city, how do they readjust? So, you know, here we are with another major shock of the pandemic. You had, you know, people uh, leaving New York City and, and leaving San Francisco. And, and sort of the question was, uh, you know, we were looking at post-industrial cities, but the question is really about over long lengths of time, how do cities adapt to change um, and how do they reinvent themselves um, kind of through the light of Baltimore and uh, these five other cities. But really, again, it, it, the lessons apply uh, much more broadly to other cities in the U.S. and, and worldwide facing um, kind of these dynamics of, of constant change. Obviously, there's no silver bullet. Um, that's what the, you know, the the Robert Moseses of the of the 20th century thought there was, right? Like, well, we'll just do this one thing and then everything will be fixed. There's a, clearly no silver bullet. But are there common threads? And like, was there anything that surprised you when you looked at it and you're like, oh man, I, I didn't realize that this is really what's driving this or is a lot of different things? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's again, it's um, the importance that there are so many uh, dynamics um, in a city and it's kind of being open to change and, and innovation. So, um, you know, a policy or a program that might've worked 10 years ago 
uh, might not work today. A, a business that was um, viable, like the car industry in Detroit um, in the 1950s, isn't going to be viable in the 1980s. So um, the, the kind of constant theme through all of this is the ability to uh, pivot um, and uh, uh, kind of rediscover yourself um, and, and what your advantages are relative to other cities. But government's not always good at that. And, and that's not me saying like I'm not like a an anti-government guy or something like that. But government has a challenge with pivoting. I mean, that's it's it. it and by design in some ways. Right. Like I think people bemoan the fact that government is slow, but by it's by design that it's slow. So it's not like revolutionary. It's evolutionary in ways. But that doesn't serve us well when technology in some ways is revolutionary. Right. Like the, I always worry about like the switch to you know, artificial intelligence and robotics. And before we know it, you know, some of these jobs that the um, middle class depends on just go away. And is government prepared to deal with that? Are there governments that are better prepared that you found or like they, they come up with ways of being more um, nimble? Yeah. So, so this is, we spend an entire um, chapter in our book on, on the urban governance challenge because it is, uh, we think so important. And, you know, as you mentioned, uh, uh, technological change um, uh, has been so rapid um, in, in recent decades that really, you know, the, the governments, the local governments that you see performing better um, have been those that have embraced big data and, and tech um, uh, solutions uh, just to make, to increase efficiency, but also doing things like um, responding to needs of residents. So, you know, looking at 311 data to see uh, trends in, in trash pickup or uh, streetlights that are out and, and being responsive to those. So, so you know, just kind of generally as a best practice, um, trying to integrate um, technology into government and use kind of, you know, this uh, idea of smart cities um, into uh, provision of um, you know, basic government services. Yeah. So, Maybe this is a good place. Well, actually, before we take a break, I'm curious. Um, so it's been a year, give or give or take, since the book was published. Are you more optimistic about the future of cities? Less optimistic? More confused? Um, less certain? Um, you know, you started writing the book before the pandemic. Then we've gone through a year where there's been such disruptions. Um, you know, and we just got out of a situation now where we're you know, looking at this rapid inflation and and the impact and the um, pressure that that's going to put certainly on local governments. Um, do do the do the numbers and the data that you guys crunched in that book still hold true, or is everything changing so fast that's hard to say now? So it's it's certainly difficult to say. I mean, we're we're definitely still optimistic about cities. Um, you know, the the folks who were calling for the decline of, of New York um, at the beginning of the pandemic, I, I think are going to be um, uh, proven incorrect in, in a couple of years' time. Um, but also for, for post-industrial cities like Baltimore uh, and uh, Cleveland and Detroit and St. Louis, I mean, I think, you know, the, the uh, economist Enrico Moretti has, has talked about the great divergence uh, of, of cities and places uh, in recent decades where you have superstar cities like New York and San Francisco and Boston and Washington, D.C. doing great, while you have many others uh, kind of in, in a spiral of decline. And I think what the pandemic has done has in, in kind of opening up the, uh, the possibility of working from home and, and remote work for those of us that are lucky enough to do that is, um, you know, kind of increased our ability to live in uh, places that are not as expensive. So if you look at a place like Baltimore, um, you know, that has a relatively uh, uh, weak market for jobs, um, you know, it's it's a 45-minute hour-long train ride to D.C. where you can uh, make considerably more money. So the possibility of, of living in, in a uh, less expensive city like Baltimore and, and working in D.C. suddenly becomes much more feasible if, you know, you can work from home for two to three uh, days a week. So I think, um, you know, some of these forces are going to um, uh, hopefully damp down uh, a little bit of what made um, New York City so attractive and in other places um, kind of less fortunate. Yeah. And I, it'll be interesting to see in that divergence what happens to the ones that were uh, the stars, you know, the San Francisco's in particular, where things were just out of control. 
Um, do they just come back to reality? <laughs> right. <laughs> you know? um, so that'll be interesting to see what happens. Let's take a quick break, and then let's come back and talk about old building stock, which you touch on in the book, um, and some thoughts around historic buildings and structures, and we'll do that right here on PreserveCast. Historic preservation can't happen without skilled tradespeople to perform the work, and there's a critical need right now for those tradespeople. The Campaign for Historic Trades, powered by Preservation Maryland, is working to meet that need by strengthening apprenticeship opportunities within historic trades. In partnership with the National Park Service's Historic Preservation Training Center and Conservation Legacy, the campaign is currently recruiting for NPS Traditional Trades Apprenticeship Program, or TTAP. TTAP is an intensive 20-week apprenticeship that provides young adults the chance to learn historic trade skills while working on America's most iconic historic sites. Multiple positions are open for the 2022 season at national parks across the country. Visit historictrades.org for more information on TTAP and how to apply today. This is Nick Redding. You're listening to PreserveCast. Today, we're joined by Mac McComas, who's the Senior Program Manager at the Johns Hopkins University's 21st Century Cities Initiative. Um, and before we took our break, we were talking about the publication of his book that he co-authored with Matthew Kahn, Unlocking the Potential of Post-Industrial Cities. And we were talking spe- you know, specifically about you know, your optimism, your certainty about the future. But let's dive into one thing that for a lot of listeners matters quite a bit, which is older building stock. And, you know, you read it every once in a while. It seems like every couple of weeks there's something that comes out. There was one a couple of weeks ago, I think it was in the Atlantic, about um, we have to stop fetishizing um, old buildings and things like that. And we, we need all new buildings. Um, and a lot of researchers and academics, particularly outside of preservation, have begun to suggest that these old places, they're an albatross around legacy cities' necks. Um, and so it's either, it seems like these days you're either like, no, these are a great resource, or no, they're the worst thing ever and we got to get rid of it. W- where do you fall on that? Are you somewhere in between? What do you feel about um, vacancy and, and these sorts of older buildings? Yeah, so I, I, I'd say I'm, I'm somewhere in between. Um, and, and talk a little bit about why. So the, the economist uh, Joseph Jorko and Ed Glazer wrote uh, kind of a foundational paper um, on durable capital in 2005 that laid out the problem that old durable capital um, uh, poses to post-industrial cities such as Baltimore and Detroit. Um, and the fundamental problem that they lay out is that um, while people are highly mobile and, and can be responsive to economic shocks, uh, buildings are not. Um, if a thousand people leave Baltimore in a year, um, the next year, the houses that they lived in don't simply disappear. They're there and, and they're expensive uh, um, for the city. Uh, they remain and, and their quality declines. Um, and this decline is, is uh, unfortunately highly persistent and kind of a, leads to a, a downward spiral. spiral. Um, and, and what Chorco and Glazer do is they show that in declining cities like, like Baltimore and Detroit, um, housing prices fall faster than uh, populations do. Um, so this presents a, a budget challenge for cities that you know have to provide basic services uh, for residents. So you know for me the the um, the question becomes, okay, well, it's a fact that Baltimore has you know tens of thousands of, of vacant houses. The question is, what do you do um, with all of that? Do you knock it down and, and try to encourage the construction of new buildings? Um, or do you try to preserve and, and rehabilitate it? And um, again, I think I'm I'm on the fence here because the local context and kind of the neighborhood and, and situation is is key here. And in some cases, you know, it will make sense to to knock it down and allow for higher density buildings. But in in other contexts, um, you know, these are beautiful buildings. Uh, there's huge value in um, in having historical centers and districts. So I think it's it's finding out the the balance between those two. Yeah, and you also make the case that like knowledge workers or whatever we call them now, but people who work with their brain um, can move around and they, they they pick, particularly if they can work from home, they pick places based on quality of living and um, expense and what kind of resources it has. I always come to the place and I think that there's some data that backs this up that 
communities with a real sense of place and architecture and places that we want to live will do better in the next century. Because if you can choose where you want to live, why would you want to live in a blur um, that looks like any other place? Why not pick a place that actually has, um, you know, a, a walkable human like scale and um, feels like something like, like that, that it's that it, there's some real authenticity to it. Um, so, and I'm curious if the, if you've seen the research that bears that out as well. Yeah, there's, there's a, a significant um, body of research that shows that uh, knowledge workers are attracted to places that have this kind of cultural capital and, and kind of um, uh, features that distinguish them from other cities. You know, Baltimore and, and its neighborhoods shouldn't try to be like Manhattan um, because well, we're never going to do as good of a job and we shouldn't be like San Francisco because we're, we should embrace what makes us unique and, um, uh, and kind of, you know, really dive deep on, and define what that means, obviously. Um, but, but embrace that. And, uh, if we do a good job of that, you know, people, uh, not everybody, but, um, uh, certain people will find value in that and, and want to live there. So, um, what is there a model that you like best for investment in place or examples that you think people should know about, you know, in terms of obviously we've identified the problem and the challenge. How do cities address this? What's the what's the best way for it? And I think the preservation community has has tried to push certain things, different tax policies and stuff like that. But is there something that you see out there that that should be um, considered? Yeah. So so if you're thinking about uh, a challenge, um, that faces a city like Baltimore or Detroit, where, where it's at such a scale, where it's tens of thousands of, of vacant housing units um, that, that need to be addressed. Um, you know, there, there are a couple models um, that, are, that are kind of promising for that for investment at that scale. Um, and, you know, this is both an administrative um, uh, solution that, that we need to have in terms of how we address kind of the pipeline of, of, of um, dealing with um, uh, previous owners and, and titles and, and tax liens and things like that. But um, on the finance side, um, uh, you know, there's there's what economists might call a, a big push um, where uh, you can finance uh, kind of at scale. Um, uh, you can get the capital to address kind of the problem at, at once. Um, and so this could look like something like um, pay for success or uh, social impact bonds um, that cities are, are uh, increasingly exploring as, as financial tools where investors provide the upfront capital that, that's going to solve uh, a problem that a local government is facing. Um, and then government will, will pay for that when um, kind of the benefits are, are bared out over the long term and there's evidence uh, of improved in impacts. And so an example of this is um, uh, Washington, D.C. Uh, recently impl implemented in environmental impact bonds that financed green infrastructure investments to solve sewer and, and stormwater uh, runoff issues. Do you think it could work for old buildings? I've looked at that same thing. I've always wondered the same thing, if that could work on, I mean, it would need to be at scale. Um, and that's that's the whole thing is that if you go at this kind of piecemeal, you're doing whack-a-mole where uh, you're solving in something in one neighborhood and then vacancy is popping up in another. So the, the whole point is, is that you have to go big and that that's this kind of big push. And, um, you know, it, it, you'd have to kind of work out what the numbers would be. But, um, you know, my co-author, Matt Kahn, and I, when we were discussing this issue uh, with with some urban eco uh, economists, um, you know, a lot of them were surprised that uh, cities like Baltimore weren't doing um, more of these kind of costly investments and taking advantage of the municipal bond market. Um you know, there was a feeling that they were being a, a little too conservative there, maybe because they were both underestimating the long term costs um, uh, to the city of not doing this, as well as underestimating the benefits. Yeah. Yeah. I think a, a lot of times in a lot of different ways, we underestimate the costs of inaction. Right. Right. And I think the more we can do and, and again, there's you know growing research on how um, you know, uh, just like uh, mowing and taking care of, of vacant lots or, um, you know, boarding up the front of, of vacant buildings can reduce kind of negative crime and, and public health um, uh, ill effects. So um, I'm curious, um, what's next for you in the 21st Century's initiative and, and where can people learn more and find out about your work? Sure. So, um, you know, 
I'm going to continue working on um, issues around quality of life and entrepreneurship in cities and economic mobility. Uh, at the moment, I'm working on uh, several reports and papers on everything from uh, looking at uh, assets at risk from uh, increasing flood risk to a uh, survey of uh, diversity uh, uh, within Baltimore City startups um, to a, a report actually right now that um, hopefully will be coming out in the next uh, three or four months. It's going to look at uh, this issue that we've been talking about around uh, some of the costs and benefits of vacant housing in, in Baltimore. Um, but we're all, always looking for, for um, both local partners and partners in other cities to engage with uh, on research. Um, so please do reach out and you can do that. You can go to our website, which is 21cc.jhu.edu, and you can sign up for our newsletter. You can find uh, our contact information there. Um, and again, just uh, we're always welcoming new uh, partners that are kind of interested and want to engage on these issues. That's awesome. And we'll put a link in the show notes um, to um, the 21st Century Cities Initiative website, so you can just click there and jump on over and follow them and and follow Mac uh, as well. Um, before we go, question we ask of everyone: um, favorite historic place or site? Yeah, so uh, one of my favorite historic buildings in Baltimore is the Old American Brewery Building in uh, Broadway East, which is now home to uh, the nonprofit uh, Humanum. And I was lucky enough to get a tour of the building. Um, uh, say four or five years ago now. Um, uh, and it was just such a beautiful building. Um, and I got to learn about its, you know, the, its redevelopment, how they were able to finance that. Um, and, uh, just learn about how it's been a, a, a really, um, you know, magnificent community anchor for that neighborhood. Um, and I think it's a great example of, you know, this is a huge, beautiful building and if you really want to knock it down when it can, you know, serve, uh, such an amazing purpose to a neighborhood. So I think it is uh, a great example of that kind of adaptive reuse uh, that you can see in old buildings. Well, it's definitely a, a good example for us, Tax Credit Project, which is a program that over at Preservation Maryland we're very supportive of and also timely in that I think it was a yesterday and into today that the city of Baltimore lost a historic brewery that was vacant and turned into a big fire issue right after we've just lost several firefighters. Um, yep. and so, um, yeah, there's, uh, there's a lot to unpack there and we'll, we'll, uh, we'll throw a, a note in the show notes as well about the, um, American brewery, which has got to be one of the coolest buildings, um, <laughs> in the country. That thing is pretty damn cool. Um, it's been really fun doing this. Um, we'll have to have you back as the research unfolds and, and thanks for joining us again today on PreserveCast. Thanks so much, Nick. I've really enjoyed it. Thanks for listening to PreserveCast. To dig deeper into this episode's story, head over to PreserveCast.org for show notes and our collection of previous episodes. Don't forget to engage with this podcast by subscribing, commenting, and leaving a review. Follow along on Instagram, Twitter, and Facebook at PreserveCast for even more. PreserveCast is currently recorded in Walkersville, Maryland, and sponsored by the 1772 Foundation and powered by Preservation Maryland. Thanks for listening and keep on preserving.